everyone. My name is Gabriela Shevchite Chibilena. I'm a lecturer in Digital Humanities Education at the Department of Digital Humanities, King's College London. And the title of my presentation is Virtual Reality Ethnography of the Transcultural Reimagining of Full and Faultness Topographies of Yokna Pataka. In this presentation, I will discuss the possibility and relevance of ethnographic and anthropological approaches to spatial imagination based on textual multilingual data. I will draw on the ongoing case study of how spatial imagination in fiction and its translations could be framed, explored and visualized in interdisciplinary ways which interrogate the ontological absence of the other imagination in world literatures and at the same time gratify the notions of text as culturally situated experiences rather than as a material artifact or language construct. I will briefly cover where this kind of exploratory research started and how the proof of concept project funded by the King's Innovation Grant is helping to move towards cross-cultural visual ethnography and anthropology of cultural production. This case study, rather in convoluted ways, emerges from my PhD research. My aim then was to explore diagrammatically and quantitatively how we could overcome the limitations of research claiming that differences in how translations deal with repetition specifically are language-based, and that there is not much to find out about inner or external circumstances of their production in lexical choices. My major premise was that translation is a journey punctuated with events, places and emotions, and thus its language should contain traces of being specific to times and spaces. Throughout 2018-19, it evolved into the collaborative project with King's Digital Lab called Distant Reading Across Languages, which took some visualizations to another level to show interactively the more global patterns of how translations differ. Many patterns emerge, revealing diverse behaviors that could be related to specific socio-historical contexts, such as the Soviet regime and its censorship of the Western other, or its oppression of minority language, languages often conditioned to translate from secondary Russian translations of Western literature, rather than directly from the original source. We could say that the Western worldviews were imported, but they were also transculturated in Soviet translation. In this study, transculturation is positioned between the notions of Cuban anthropologist Orkiv and British ethnographer Malinovsky to embrace wide-ranging forms of cultural reception produced in distance and close proximity to the colonial. On the one hand, Soviet society positioned itself in a polemic relationship with the West as a permanent threat on the political and intellectual levels. On the other hand, ethnic discrimination and linguistic colonialism oppression as a lingua franca took place right within the Soviet society. Literary translations were producing tensions between the uh, official ideology and its subversion. Religious words, and not only, would often disappear in a nod to the regime, for example. But the selfish gene of a translator would also leave its imprint in the fabric of translated worlds. On the individual level, transculturation is even more layered and complex than envisaged by Orkiv and Malinovsky. In our personal communication, one of the translators admitted that she positioned herself against the other translator, who had the monopoly over Faulkner at the time, but whose approach was insensitive to the writer's passion and pain, as she explains in hindsight. This testimony embodies her disagreement and undoing of the gaze of someone who came from inside the system. Spatial imagination plays a significant role in the production of fiction. The narrative devices of maps drawn or described, references to places and objects and the like, place us in fictional worlds. Imaginary topographies are factual in a twofold way, for they derive from a sense of reality and produce an effect of reality. While scholarship on Faulkner and other writers is vast, the authentic gaze of a translator often remains invisible. Translator's invisibility is a well-known and studied problem in translation studies, but not beyond, for many reasons on which I won't expand on this presentation. Spatial representations in novels are ideological, argues Wilson, since they are situated in specific contexts. The factuality of imaginary topographies changes in translation because it no longer belongs to the writer. Barrier aptly notices that a translator's right to have the biography has not been recognized, as a legitimate subject in literary criticism until recently. What might appear as a literary or linguistic problem of translators' invisibility in the long shadow cast by Faulkner or any other author is actually a sociological issue of indifference towards the presence and relevance of the other imagination. In very concrete ways, the language reflects how the factuality of spatial imagination changes in translations, 
In this following slide, you see some examples from uh, the comparison of translations. In the Soviet Russian translation, the recurring word house, for example, was rendered with variants that back translate as house, slum, hut, facade, or door. This variation should be about something else than mere differences in languages. The Russian choice for the words hut and slum were made specifically in the passages describing the area populated by black communities, as if the translator tried to amend the semiotic injustice in the underrepresentation of racial poverty in Faulkner. Or perhaps these choices were guided by the firm hand of an editor who was also a censor in the Soviet period. But the result is all the same. The visual field has changed. The word gate uh, was rendered as gate and wicked in the early Polish version. While there was nothing ideological about it, this inconsistency signifies two points of entry which do not exist in Faulkner's topography. Another example comes from the post-Soviet Lithuanian version, which translates barn with the words denoting a stackyard or threshing floor and horse pad, none of which are direct translations. Curious enough, the other Lithuanian word Tvarkas would have been a more literal translation of what Faulkner envisaged in his novel. In architectonic and functional terms, the Lithuanian Quemus is neither equivalent to American barn nor American stackyard. Quemus served to store, dry, and thresh various crops only. Once again, the topography changes on a semiotic level, which has implications on the symbolic meaning of the place. It also alludes to other worlds in which translation is rooted beyond Faulkner's imagination. By convention, these could be considered mistakes, errors, inconsistencies, and the like. But for me, these are a golden mine to explore the experiential aspects of the translating mind, wandering between cultures, languages, fantasies, and places. The more polished and edited the translation, the less authentic it is from an anthropological perspective. But here is a problem in showing these phenomenological differences in spatial imagination by means of flat 2D visualization, as you see in this next slide. The graph on your left summarizes how each instance of the word house, for example, was rendered in three translations. Even if you know these languages, it forces you into a tabular linear scrutiny. The graph on the right side does it so much better. It's rhetorically more eloquent and concise yet none reveals tectonic shifts in visual imagination. These limitations in visualization challenge uh, our assumptions and practices of how research could be and is being done to bring forward perspectives and senses of otherness as being embe embedded in the prototypical cultural field and the sound of another language. With two talented MA students on the DH program, Sonia Dubnik and Joanna McKenton, to model spatial differences as immersive experiences, we chose to focus on the barn and its Lithuanian translation as Koimas. The experimental wireframes of which you see in the slide before they will be modeled and built in Blender, and then embedded visually and acoustically in Unity-generated content. They are a long way from what we want to model as archetypal, prototypical, and individually symbolic to Faulkner and his translator. But the building of these models is our principal instrument with which we think and generate research questions. Our interests chime in with an exciting project led by John Wall called the Virtual Holds Cross Project, which is a digital reconstruction of John Donne's Gunpowder Day sermon delivered in 1622 in London. The Virtual Holds Cross Project draws on evidence from paintings, drawings, and engravings about the appearance of Paul's uh, churchyard outside St. Paul's Cathedral in London, combined with archaeological evidence about the location, size, and design of the structures within that space, and with evidence about the climate, local weather, and angle of sunlight providing illumination for that space at various times of day throughout the year, it materializes the experiences of the past, but also opens a pathway for new modes of research making. The project resulted in two models, the visual and the acoustic reconstruction of the sermon being delivered on the day. Our current scale is far more modest than Wald's project. Our evidence data and the task at hand are also so different that we need to figure out first the method of translating textual data into immersive visuals when we deal with ahistorical or meta-historical discourse.
The choice of the barn and Coimas is generous since it provides rich polysemous and polyphonic architectonic images to interrogate how differently these two images structure the visual fields of their beholders. Barn is a huge archetype and topos in American literature and movies. Barn frequently appears in Faulkner's literary works such as The Sound and the Fury, Barn Burning, Lit Light in August and other. Barn is also significant to Faulkner's biography. Gabriela Gutting, the researcher of Faulkner's maps of his imaginary county of Yokmar Katakwa, which structures fictional topographies in his novels, notes that the visual element is an important factor in William Faulkner's work, both as an integral part of his narrative technique and as a component that inspired the creative processes of his writing. The factuality of his imaginary places is, root is rooted in his visual inspirations drawn from concrete places he lived, maps he drew, his own illustrations and the paintings done by others, to mention a few. While piecing together a collage of Faulkner's encounters with other people from his correspondence and family albums, Watson notices parallels between Faulkner and his literature as Faulkner casts his multiple selves into fictional characters. His home, called Roman Oak, is a place which also made a very sensory imprint on his novels. In 1930, Faulkner purchased the dilapidated house and grounds for $6,000. Uh, His offer was modest, but was accepted over others because he was the only bidder who proposed restoration. Faulkner wrote each morning, did much of the renovation himself for the rest of the day. For example, he built or designed the stable, the cow barn is featured in this uh, slide, and other outbuildings on grounds. However fascinating the place is, its topography cannot provide details for the barn as envisaged in The Sun and the Fury, for the novel was published a year before the family obtained the prop property and moved in. Although the American barn has undergone many transformations and has been embraced by urban development that pushed the boundary on traditional architecture, our evidence for the model of Faulkner's barn will have to be confined to his time and places. Meanwhile, our model of the Lithuanian Koyimas will have to be based on a much wider interpretation extending into the other half of the 20th century when the translation was produced. The ecologies of animal and plant cultivation were separated in the Lithuanian context. Koimas was the domain of plants, which were considered no less alive than animals and humans. Bartis, on the other hand, which is the equivalent of the American barn, is where the farm animals were housed. Koimas evolved from a singular building to a complex with specialized areas for processing rye or drying flax, which could have been transferred then uh, to separate outbuildings. But some architectonic elements persisted throughout time. Koimas also marks the east-west divisions. It is specific to the eastern regions of Lithuania. Unlike Faulkner's barn, filled with the sounds of cows and horses, Lithuania Koimas was embedded in a different sound ecology, depending on the crop that was processed at the time, rye, barley or flax. The episode that I'm going to share with you comes from the movie called The Origins, directed by Gitis Lukšas in 1984. Uh, the movie is a poetic rather than archaeological reconstruction of uh, past life in the Lithuanian countryside, where the director wanders around redreaming the past. The movie, however, upset the Central Committee of the Communist Party, which dubbed it too ethnic uh, for Soviet viewers then. Moscow took it as a tribute to the bourgeois past. Despite the ban, the movie was secretly screened across the country for several years. The episode uh, shows the processing of flags accompanied by the sounds of wooden instruments and polyphonic singing. Some historical sources shed light on how labor was organized, structured, and performed. 
For example, that riots rushing would need ideally six people, each of them beating in rhythm in succession to avoid clashes and harming each other. Each participant would chant their part, reflecting the structure of collective labor. Depending on how many people were involved, ritualized and art pipe, labor songs are thus reminiscent of what we know now as hip-hop music. It is only in the ecology of Klaimath that the labor performance could have evolved into a theater genre that takes its name from the building. The Klaimath theater has survived until nowadays, of course, largely, largely recontextualized as something exotic from the past, rather than a Baroque explosion of existence released from the restraints of work as you see in these pictures. I don't think we have the right vocabulary for this kind of research yet. We are practicing something between reconstruction, transmediation, recontextualization, memory studies, speculative design, visual, digital ethnography, and anthropology. But it is not reconstruction at its, as it is practiced in archaeology, for example. Neither is it a transmediation of fiction, since it requires some rigor in gathering historical and ethnographic evidence. Limitations are also there such as not being able to interview all translators, or translators not being able to recreate their first encounters and impressions. The principles of the virtual cults, uh, virtual cults cross projects, such as representative approximation or historical appropriateness that John Wall iteratively draws on, is hardly relevant to our subject as well. We are primarily dealing with the ontologies of absence to create a blueprint to explore world building across languages. What we behold are spectral landmarks of fictions as testimonies of imagination lost or to be lost in time. Unfortunately, my time is up and this is where I have to stop. Thank you very much for your attention.